Julie, hi. Hey, Mama. How are you? Good. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I'm sitting here in the June gloom that is uh, Southern California in June. It's a little cloudy. Is but... it is it the same way? I mean, because here it is too, and I'm like, okay, am I missing something? Is it not supposed to be summer right now? <laughs> I know. Well, for us, this is kind of normal. It's like May gray and June gloom, so we don't really get the sun until July, August, September, October, and all the rest of the months. But for two months out of the year, just it's rub gray. it in. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I do not envy the middle of the country during the winter. How are you adjusting, by the way? I'm how, not. How are you making the adjustment? <laughs> I'm not. Not to the weather, at least. It's got to be tough, be girl. An, oh, man. I'm brutally honest. Because even, like, I see the weather back home, and I'm like, and it's 80s. And then I'm like, yeah. here, it's 60s and 70 and fog. So... Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm trying to make the best of it. And everybody keeps telling me this is an anomaly. This is not normal Chicago uh, summer. So I don't, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for it to finally be summer so I can actually enjoy um, Chicago. Because it's a beautiful city and there's so much stuff to do. Oh, yeah. But when it rains and it's cold, I'm like, uh, I just want to stay home and watch Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> oh, my God, are you watching it? Yes. yes. Did you watch last night? Girl, okay. So let me tell you something about that show. <laughs> so I was a late adopter. I did not get into it until it was already in its second season. So I was playing catch up. I binged the first season. And I was like, yes. okay, that's kind of messed up. But then I started to watch the second season and I got pretty much a, almost to the end. I think two mm -hmm. episodes shy of the, the whole second season. By the way, I was pregnant. <gasps> so watch okay for those of you who don't watch handmaids you need to watch it you need to watch it and i'm sorry we're talking about this this is not baseball but it's just I such a good show and if you're pregnant while watching that second season of handmaid's tale it, yeah <laughs> do not watch do, do not, not watch. watch yes do not watch while being pregnant and the second season because it is a lot of emotional roller coaster that you will go to and just wait because you haven't gotten to the last episode so wait Wait till you get to that last episode in second season. And then when you get to season three, episode one, two, and three, girl, you you, you got to binge watch this, okay? <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. All right, so let's get right into this hour. Yeah. Uh, Julie, tell, tell us a little bit about yourself for those of the for those of the fans who don't know who you are and what you do. I've known you since way back when with the New York Mets. Yes, girl, we go back all the way just to kind of set the stage. Yeah, my career started in New York, working for Sportsnet New York, New York SNY yeah. with the mm -hmm. Mets, and you, my darling, were the only other female face that I ever saw in the Mets dugout. You were the only other woman on the field with me there <laughs> pre-game. You were the only woman there during BP. You were the only woman over there still, you know, conducting interviews, interviews in the dugout. And and I always I remember looking at you and just being like, man, that's so cool. She's doing it too, and like I. I love that. And, and we're I, doing I, it. And then we're here we're together. Doing it. We're doing it together. So, so yeah. So mad props, by the way, because 10 years ago, and I can't believe that was 10 years ago. Okay, please don't say that. <laughs> that was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, because 2008 was my first year with Sportsnet New York, but I was doing that sort of sports trivia game show called Beer Money, which it really wasn't, you know, hardcore sports. It was just, you know, Close asking it. trivia questions to drunk fans in bars, but it, it was a big hit with New Yorkers. And then I ended up doing Mets Weekly 2009, which is the first year of City Field after they um, rebuilt after the uh, affectionately remembered Shea Stadium. Yes. And so 2009 uh, and 2010, I hosted Mets Weekly and then went over to the entertainment side. I was a VJ on MTV and then started covering college football 2011, 2012 for Fox and Big Ten Network. And then 2013, went back to baseball, been out of it for a few years, went back to baseball as the sideline or rather in-game reporter for the Washington Nationals on Masson, Mid-Atlantic Sports Network, where I became, I guess you could say, internet famous for the mm -hmm. Gatorade dumps, which uh, it's to this day, if you Google my name, that's like the first thing that comes up. I think it made like every ESPN, Gatorade corporate, 
um, <laughs> like highlight reel for their holiday parties. Um, so that was my first day on the job and uh, got completely dumped on, but it was like their thing, so show of affection. And uh, 2013 um, also came, 2013 was working for the Washington Nationals, 2014 and 15 came back to New York City, was doing an entertainment news show, and 2016 moved out to San Diego, and you're seeing those pictures right there. Yep. Of, uh, Working, working for uh, the San Diego Padres. And uh, I've been out here in San Diego ever since. I decided to stay and it's been, it's been awesome. And then in addition to that, I was hosting a show on MLB Network um, and also uh, MLB Fox, which was called MLB 162. And that was sort of the updated version of TWIB and where we just covered, you know, this week in baseball basically. And here we are. And here we are. It's a long journey. Out of out of all of those, what what was the most memorable for you? I would say the 2013 uh, season with the Washington Nationals is when I think back. I think that holds my fondest memories. Well, God, it's hard to say. Each season was so different and and so wonderful in so many different ways. But for me, I think living in D.C that summer of 2013 was so incredibly special for me because I feel like I really hit my stride. I feel mm -hmm. like that team was very special. Um, the relationships I built within those players, the staff, I thought um, to me were very, very fulfilling. So um, that would, I, I would have to say that was probably my favorite season, but I think back to New York and I'm originally from Queens. I grew up in a Mets family to have that be my first job coming up with names like that I grew up with, like Jesse Orozco and Keith Hernandez. And it, it, that was just, that was brilliant. So that was really cool. And working with David Wright, I mean, I don't know that I've ever come across a player like that. I mean, that's a once in a generation. I mean, we see Mike Trout, who I've actually never met, but who they say is, is very similar, but David Wright was incredible. Yeah, um, and I have, um, we're showing that picture of you with David. And yeah. I mean, I, I know, he was just an amazing person and obviously a yes. really great player, but off the field, I mean, he was always willing to give all of us time, right? Yes. Yes. And, and in a way, and I don't know if you do this, I, I have to stop myself from doing this because, you know, even as a, as a performer, as a personality, as an on-air personality that mm -hmm. you and I both are, we have our on-air personas, we have our off-air personas. Yes. Same thing with players. They have their on-field personas, they have their off-field personas. And, you know, one of the polls I wanted to poll with the audience is, would you want to meet your favorite player if you knew that he really wasn't such a great guy? And not every player is a great guy. Not every TV actor and actress is a great person. They can be great on the field and not so great off the field. David was one of those just stellar human beings that was All, all the be, way through. All the way through all the way around, a crazy, amazing baseball player, crazy, amazing human. And yeah. like you said, always made time, always made time. And I mean, we've been stood up. We've been. <laughs> yeah, like I'll be right back. I'll, I'll I'll talk to you when I'm done with BP. And then like you never see them. You're like, well, wait, wait where did you? OK. Yeah. Right. And, and, and you have a job to do, too. Right. You have deliverables. You have a deadline that you're like, I told my producers I would get this interview and now I don't have it because you didn't want to talk. But but hey, every you know every player has their thing, and you know they've got treatment. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that a lot of fans don't know. Like some fans might be upset that they don't sign autographs. Well, mm -hmm. they may have had to go back and be seen by the by the trainers. You know, they may have had to go watch video. They may have had to go watch tape. So there's so much that goes into it. But but for me, there's every now and then you come across those amazing players who are just as wonderful on the field as they are off the field and fun to watch. And he was one of those players. Um, so yeah, I, I just have so many fun baseball memories. There's something so magical about being on a baseball field pre-game. I don't know, do you feel that? Do you feel yeah, that sort and, of energy? And and I'm, yes, to me, and I always said this, it's almost like going to the beach when you're there right before, like it's calm and it's, there's something just about being there that's very soothing. And there, when there's just nobody on the field and you're just there just waiting, you can kind of soak it all in. And especially when I first started, it was very uh, surreal for me to be on a Major League Baseball field, not, let alone sitting in the dugout, you know, where, where these yeah. players sit. And for me and, and you, I mean, I started off really covering a lot of the Mets. 
And so Shea Stadium was a big part of my career and my life. And so I have really a lot of fond memories of being at, at Shea and in Queens. When they knocked it down, I was like, I almost, you know, shed a tear because it's like, oh, my goodness, so many memories out out in Shea. And, and then now it's City Field. But there's not, not, there was nothing like, and just like there was nothing like the old Yankee Stadium. There was nothing like, like Shea. Yeah, I agree. I agree. What, so t- take me back. How did your career start and how did it start with the Mets? Um, so my I started off actually in entertainment and then one day the producer that I was working with at the time was going to launch a new show and she asked me if I wanted to continue to do entertainment or if I wanted to do something else. So I said to her, you know what, can I do sports? And just because I was a sports fan, I just, I liked sports, I liked baseball particularly and that's where I started and the Mets just ended up being um, the team that opened doors for me Uh, you remember Shannon Uh, when Shannon was there Shannon always just helped me out with credentials whatever I needed I remember one of my first interviews well my first interview of a baseball player was Carlos Bertrand when he was with the Mets so that was my first ever interview of an athlete, let alone of, of, of a baseball player. And then my second was what was... Which, by the way, and I want to stop you right there. That yeah. was not an easy yeah. interview to get, girl. He no. was not an easy interview. So but kudos to you. But I'll tell you this. I never had a hard time with Carlos. I, and everybody, because everybody used to say the, the same thing, and, and it was, and, and it's always because he had a, a very similar, you know, similar work ethic to, to Yadi, who like if you're in BP and like he's focused on on getting his stuff done. Yeah. But for some reason, I just I always I probably ask at the correct time because that's that's usually what it is. What if they, if they're really focused and if it's a really tough series or if they're slumping, they don't really want to talk. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be honest, right? They don't really want to talk. Um, But yes, I I had the opportunity to to interview Carlos. So he was my first ever interview. And then when I launched my own show, La Chica Deportes, he was my first interview for my La Chica Deportes show. So I I have fond, very fond memories of of Carlos. And now uh, I I try to continue to cover him and what he's doing with the Yankees, but also what he's doing in Puerto Rico with the Carlos Bertrán Academy. And him and his wife have been doing a stellar job out there and with their foundation and what they did with Puerto Rico and what they continue to do for Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. Um, shout out to, to them if they're watching because uh, uh, it, it's not easy to, to have a baseball life and continue to, to give back in the way that that they do. So, um, yeah, so then I, I just I continue to just cover the Mets because it was just that that's where my doors were really open. And if you remember when we were there, that's when, like, the core Latino group, was with the Mets. I mean, so it was yeah. Beltran, it was Jose yeah. Reyes, yep. Duque was there, um, Delgado. Delgado was there. Yeah. So it was this core of Latino players who just, it made it Castillo. so much fun. Castillo, Luis Castillo, yeah. um, Tatis, so Fernando Tatis' dad yeah. was there as well. So yeah, it was a lot of, um, of Latinos in Queens, in, at the, in the Mets team. And so it just made it a lot more fun for me too to to cover at the time and and here we are now yeah <laughs> and here I we are am. now on la vida la vida baseball now i want to go so today is wednesday uh steve you take my my computer real quick way back wednesday so here's a picture <laughs> of you in your little mets bomber jacket and here I am with my teammates, high school teammates at the time, uh, rocking number six, because that's always been my number. And I had pinstripes. I was a, a, a Comets. It was a Hackensack Comets. So where, where did your affinity for baseball begin? Oh, that would have to be with my parents. Uh, my mom's from Puerto Rico. Let me take off my jacket because I'm hot. <laughs> so, <laughs> Got to keep it warm there. It's so cold outside. Oh, yeah. Um, my mom's from Puerto Rico, and she came up in a uh, has a big, 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 big Puerto Rican family, and they were all huge baseball fans, and they were all Mets fans, even though she was raised in the Bronx. So. I had asked him, I was like, well, yeah. you know, how, you're in the Bronx. Why didn't you become a Yankees fan? Like, isn't that kind of how it worked? Like, if you lived in, you know, I don't know, in Queens, then maybe. 
but um but she's from the bronx and and she always was a mets fan that was the whole family that's how she was brought up and then my dad was my dad's a bit older so my dad was actually a brooklyn dodgers fan back when he was a kid mm -hmm. and he also lived in the bronx but he would take the train down um, all the way <laughs> to Ebbets and he would take in some Brooklyn Dodgers fans, uh, Brooklyn Dodgers games. And then when the Brooklyn Dodgers left, he was heartbroken. I think he was about like 10 years oh. old, maybe eight, 10 years old. And you know, for a little kid, when your team, I mean, it doesn't happen that Just often, but if your team up and leave, picks yeah. up and leaves for the West Coast, a place that you have no concept of. <laughs> at that age, that far away, your heart, I mean, your world is just over. And he, he would, he once took me on a, on a tour of Soundview up in the Bronx where he was from. And he said, see that window? He's like, I contemplated jumping out that window when the Dodgers left. Brooklyn. Oh no. And he was so <laughs> distraught. He was so distraught. But um and then of course when when the Mets uh came to be and they were playing at the Polo Grounds, he became a Mets fan. Um because of course the Yankees, how could he ever like the Yankees? They were still an enemy of the Brooklyn Dodgers, and so he became a Mets fan. So I was sorry, long story, but uh, to answer your no, question. No, no, it's okay. Uh, I, my fandom uh, for baseball really started with my parents. My parents, just to put it in perspective, my parents were the type of people that had a VHS recording of the 86 Mets. Okay. They had the 86 World Series on a VHS tape. And even when they had already moved to California, we moved out to Southern California um, when I was young, they would watch it. Like if it was a, a, a gloomy day or something and they'd just be hanging out, they're like, let's watch They just that pop mess. back in. Let's just pop it back in and watch it. <laughs> and so, so is is your and I'm sorry to cut you off, but is your family still in New York? So a lot of my extended family is still in New York, New Jersey, and all the way up to Rhode Island and then all the way down to Coconut Grove, Miami, and okay. South Florida. So oh, okay. they kind of spread out. I was gonna my, say because of SN, cause SNY, you know, has those the classic games. So yes. I was like, oh, so do they sit on a rainy day and watch the classics? <laughs> well, at the time, and I'm totally dating myself, but at the time, like there was no MLB package, right? No, there was no like no. if you left the tri-state area, you didn't get SNY, and back then there was no SNY. So like, this was, I mean, I'm talking like early '90s. So like they had moved out to. Southern California and of course everything was Dodgers and Angels and so they would literally pop in the VHS and they would watch them some Mets and like so I grew up with that and then also when I was living in Queens my favorite player was Gary Carter he was my absolute favorite and unfortunately I never got a chance to meet him he passed away um, mm -hmm before I was really ensconced in baseball. And so I never got a chance to meet him. I, I wish I did. I, I've heard amazing, nothing but amazing things that he was one of those guys that was just as awesome on the field as he was off the field. But, um, but yeah, so that's where my baseball fandom started. And, uh, and then as a kid, like, you know, because we were in Southern California, my parents had no choice. So I grew up going to Dodgers games pretty much. <laughs> and then when my younger brother was born, he became a huge Angels fan. So now we have a family oh. So, so yeah, he went. Little, yeah, so there's a little rivalry. Yeah, here. he there was a little bit. I mean, he went AL, so that's that's a that's a statement <laughs> right there. So, do, I'm do kidding. They still, I'm kidding. Do they, do, do they still root for for the Mets? Yeah, I mean, my it's dad. It's hard to root for them, it's though. No. Hard. <laughs> I mean, it's so hard. And plus, like, you know, with anyone who's working. Yeah. You have who's working in the industry. You have a different view. So like, sometimes you know a little bit too much, and then you're just like, ah, oh, it's so hard to root for this team because I know mm -hmm. too much. Yeah. But but at the same time, uh, I think my dad, in solidarity with my brother, roots for the Angels just because he can go uh -oh. to the games. <laughs> but um, but yeah, they still definitely keep track. And of course, for any team that I'm associated with, my parents are always tracking and and always watching as much as they can. And they all have the MLB package, so they're watching games all the time. But. Um, but yeah, that's how I got. How did you get into it? You were playing. So, yeah, I played. So I played. I played softball, the uh, little league. Maybe when I when I turned seven, 
I think I started playing softball. And then, so that's how, like, it got started. And I used to watch, obviously, all the games with my dad. We'd always sit and, and watch a lot of the Yankee. I w- we watch more Yankee games than, than anything else. So my mm-hmm. house, so I, I grew up a Yankee fan. And so I, ca- I kind of thought I was semi-Yankee right when I was playing in high school because we had pinstripes. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, that was, like, my whole thing. I'm like, yeah, I gotta, yeah, play for the Yankees, and I wear number six. And, you know, Joe Torre's number was number six. So I always said, he's got my number. <laughs> I don't know, because he's got my number. That was a number that wow. I always used. It's the date of my birthday, um, April 6th. So that was always my, my number. And then growing up, my favorite players were Derek Jeter and Andy Pettit. When I had the chance to interview both of them, I mean, I almost peed, me, peed my pants. Yeah. I, I, was, I was such a fit girl, and I was nervous. I, when I, I got to interview Derek in his last year, and I went, went up to him. He was, I was there early, because that's why I, I like to get to be Pete early, because you never know who you're going to run into. So I was there early, and Derek was out taking BP early. So I just went up to him and I'm like, hey, Derek, you have a couple minutes? And he said, well, not right now, but when I finish, um, I'll come back. I'll go, let me go, let me go finish. And I said, okay. So in my head, I'm like, ah, he's not coming back. (laughs) All of a sudden, Derek finishes and he's like, all right, ready to go? And I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, I'm right. And then, but the funny thing was is that he, so, you know, we all have our good sides, right? So he stood on my side, and I'm like, uh, do I move him or do I just suck it up? And then I'm like, no, I'm gonna move him. I moved him. So I'm like, oh, you did Derek. not. I moved you him. You said, like, Derek wait. Jeter, can you yeah, move? I move? Yeah, I said, I was like, wait, I, I kind of just pushed him. I was like, wait, actually, over here. He's like, he looked at me and laughed because he knew exactly what I was doing. He's like, oh, don't tell me that's your good side. He's like, because that's my good side, too. He's like, so we're just going to both stand here like this and just do it. <laughs> so he was, uh, he was so much fun about it. And then we ended up being oh a lot God. of fun. And I'm like, oh, you know, so it was a dream come true. And I told him how growing up, I used to have a life-size poster of him in my room. Get out. You had a fat head of Derek. I had a fat head of Derek, yes. And it actually used to scare me at night because you just see the shadow. Um, It was, yes, I had a (laughs) life-sized Derek Cheater poster growing up in the back of my door. A friend of mine gave it to me for, for my birthday, Daniel Caroli. Damn, remember that. Um, gave it to me for my birthday. I don't even remember. I think we were in middle school. And and it was funny when I'm telling him the story, he's like, oh, so this was like last year, right? Because I'm telling him this was when I was growing up. And he's like, so now you're making me look like how old? Um, so, so yeah, so that was my Derek Jeter moment. And then... True or false, I, did you practice making out with the Derek Jeter fat head on false, your wall as false, a baby? False. <laughs> <laughs> False, but I did take a couple of like pictures next to him and like hugging. Okay, okay, like, just check. like yeah, no, no, no making out with the poster. <laughs> Dreams, I don't know what to tell you, but no making out with the poster. <laughs> but um, then my so my other favorite player who was Andy Pettit, and I think he was a lot of um, he had a lot of female fans because of that stare. That like that just in very intense stare that he would have on the mound, and so growing up, I loved Andy Pettit. I, I mean, he was one of the most dominant pitchers there was. Yeah. And I got to interview him at Yankee Stadium. I guess it was two, maybe two years ago. Yeah, I think two years ago. I saw him, and I was just like, "Oh my God, it's Andy Pettit! I need, to, I need, to, just I need two minutes with him." And so I just stood there and waited, and he was so nice. Couldn't have been nicer, uh, and just open and we talked a little bit it was around father's day actually so yeah it was around this time and talked about father's day talked about him probably still having it and in the tank and being able to probably pitch a couple of of games (laughs) Uh, so so that was really cool who was the first player that you interviewed that you were maybe a little starstruck oh man i mean i want to say when i well he wasn't a player but keith Uh hernandez oh yeah. Right. I mean, he was always in the dugout. He was always around pregame um, at City Field. And like, I remember that first year in '09. I mean, I had heard this man's name in my house since I could remember. And I heard my parents talk about him. And my Titi Kina had the biggest 
crush on him and I'm totally calling her out right now, but she loves him. And I just, I mean, yeah, I would say he was probably the first person that I was like, oh my God, that's Pete Hernandez. Oh my God. And he couldn't have been nicer and funny and, and had the best sense of humor and was, was lovely. Um, but it's funny you were talking about uh, Pettit. I think it, having that energy, there are certain players that have a level of intensity. I'll just call it intensity where it's like, you approach them and it's almost like approaching like a wild animal. Like you don't want to get too close to them. Yes, you know yeah. what I mean? I know yeah. it's a weird way to like describe no, no, it. No, I know exactly like, what you're saying. You know what I'm saying? Like there's a couple of it that it's like, there, there's just so much energy there. And for me, that was Jason Worth. Where like, oh. you almost didn't want to approach, you're almost afraid to yeah, approach Yeah, you're even almost scared. Yeah. Scared, yeah. I was like so intimidated. And again, could not have been a, a nicer person, but a very emotional player. And a very yeah. emotional, and who felt those emotions. And, and after a tough series, after, after you know, a, a poorly played game, would really, <laughs> really feel it. And, uh -huh. and you would feel that energy too. And it was hard not to, I'm, I'm a empath as a person i'm a very empathetic person so it was hard for Same me not thing. to take that emotion on when i would be speaking to them post game and and he was he was definitely one of those guys that he felt the high highs and he felt the low lows and he yeah he was he was that player for me for sure cool cool so now yeah. we're so in our hour, we're going to be talking a bunch of different things. I want to go into our what's going to be one of our I think, staples, just because we're both girls and we love fashion, obviously. Um, so who or what? Gabe, if you can grab my computer real quick. And let's start with last night, Aroles Chapman at this event that the, um, the New York Yankees had. Uh, and this is what he was wearing. Ooh. Fly, dress yeah. to the nines, pink, head to toe. I mean, I absolutely loved it. I love the outfit. What they so what they did was um so run run uh, runway heroes is an organization that collaborates with top fashion brands to orchestrate runway shows featuring pediatric cancer fighters and survivors founded in 2014 by rachel goldman the organization looks to provide confidence boosting experience for children with cancer in addition to all funds raised from its events are donated to childhood cancer research and the yankees were part of this really great fashion show with kids with cancers and survivors of cancer and look at man i mean look at him just fly as all anything walking next to this beautiful little girl they just look amazing Oh yeah, florals are huge this year. Florals yeah. are huge, and he's just on trend, he on is. trend in that gorgeous rosé all day colored blazer. He's working he, it. I love. I love a man who can rock a floral man. Yes, not everybody can. Not everybody can. And then there's a couple mm -hmm. of other guys who were at the fashion show. Um, Steve, if you could take my computer. So here we've got Ben Cashman, who looks like he's having a, a whole lot of fun. And this is something that I'd like to see that, you know, guys enjoying themselves off the field and just having a blast. There's Brian Cashman. Here we have Domingo Germán um, enjoying himself at the show. So now, moving right along to guys who were not at the show, but guys who love fashion. Bether Strope. Bether Strope is in a class in a league of his own. So this was when they all dressed up as cowboys. Tell me if he's not the flyest cowboy you've ever seen. I mean, that is a midnight, all night, tonight, tomorrow night cowboy. It's a lot, and I, I'm here for it. And, I mean, I love the black on black with white. Yeah. Everything matches. The the belt, the, it's like the belt buckle is, um, what is it, of a bull or, or something. And I just yeah. I love it. The bling, everything. He's, so He's much so bling. on point. Yep, so on point. <laughs> So much, so much, so much bling. He's amazing. Just I love it. And there's so many That's other awesome. guys that 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 just are able to, to rock fashion in a way that nobody else can. I mean that Chapman, I think Chapman took the cake. And we've got a video, I believe. If we can play that real quick. I asked him who was the best dressed on the team. And let's just take a look at what he said. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Mejor vestido. Del equipo. Oh. 
Eh, a ver. Bueno, para mí. Eh, sí, sí. Me gusta. Me gusta cómo se viste. Eh, y yo. Te iba a decir Gio, me dijo que tú, que tú eras el mejor vestido de, del equipo, que le gusta como así tu, tu flow, tu swag. <laughs> so yeah, so CC and then him, of course. There's just, I was like, I'm surprised he wasn't his number one choice, but they, they all know. I asked Gio, Ursula as well, and yeah, Chapman all the way. <laughs> um... Any, any guys that you, when you were following baseball, that you kind of looked at and were like, wow. Oh, yeah. This well. well, this one you'll remember. Do you remember uh -huh. Oliver Perez? When yes. he would roll up. Dude was just bedazzled. Like, he wore <laughs> more, <laughs> well, I guess we, you would call it embellish jeans. Embellish like yeah. Right? It was like at the it height like of the true religion. Yeah. Gene craze, remember? <laughs> and yeah. he would show up, like, I just remember pregame, like, he would show up and he would just be in, you know, the bowels of the stadium and he would come out, like, into the clubhouse and he would walk in with, like, you know, all of this machismo and, like, all of this energy and he would just be in these, like, skin tight, like, um, affliction <laughs> shirts. I think they were, like, affliction shirts. Oh, my shirts, goodness. Right? You with, remember like, that I remember era? this. And he was just like, and, and the hair was like all spiked and stuff. And I'm like, I don't know that I've ever seen anything like this. He was just like, I just actually, I actually ran into him. Uh, they were here. So he was here a couple of weeks ago. And as soon as I saw him, because I hadn't seen him in a really long time. And yeah. as I just went, I tapped him on the shoulder, he looked back. He's like, oh, they gave me a big hug because I hadn't seen him in such a long time. But I forgot about that era and how all yeah it's unfortunate oliver perez is not on social media because guys we would have some really great pictures for you ali i know what's up why aren't you on ali. instagram ali get with it <laughs> get like, with it right get with it because i don't even know what his style would be like now did you see Me so neither. Saw him, he was in uniform oh so he, he was, was in uniform. uniform okay yeah he wasn't in street clothes because like i no. wonder if you know how some guys like Some guys will have, they're still holding on to that true religion phase. They're still holding on to that early 2000s, like, look of, like, the tight T-shirt or the button-down that's, like, buttoned down to here that's, like, super tight with a big collar and the French cuffs. Like, they're still rocking that. <laughs> and so I'd just be I'm interested just to know if, like, he's still hanging on or, like, if he's giving it up and he's, like, going for the high waters and, like, the tailored suits. Hopefully, hopefully. He gave all of that up and is now, um, who knows, just, you know, making it work. Yeah. Making it making work. Making it work. I know, well, 2016, when I was covering the Padres, their shortstop, Alexei Ramirez, was uh, the Cuban Missile from the White Sox. He yes. was the fashion plate in that clubhouse. I mean, I think he and I probably could have worn the same size jeans. He had, like... I would say maybe for a man, like maybe a size 28 waist. And like he wore like the most bold, bright Versace, like Gucci, like had all the brand names and would just roll up in the tightest suits with the brightest skin tight. Like imagine like day club in Miami. That was like his style. Oh and my it was, goodness. it was pretty epic. It was epic. I missed that. It was, it was pretty awesome. So, Uh, we've got a couple of names that we've, we need to choose one name for our, our hour. And we want the fans to vote. So if you go on Twitter, I believe the polls are already up. I could be mistaken. Let me check on my, on my phone. But yes. so if you're watching fans out there, you can go to Twitter and yes, and ask us, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm reading some of the posts, so they're, they're making fun that you asked me if I, if I kissed Derek Jeter fat. I just thought, <laughs> I'm sorry, I did that to you, I'm sorry. It's all good, it's all good. It was oh, we're here man. to have fun. And so, but going back to, to the polls, 
Oh, here. Who who would you like to meet? Uh, would you like to meet your favorite player, even if they weren't a nice person? Let's see what's trending. So yes, fifty three percent say yes, and forty seven percent say no. Huh? Would you? Would even though like knowing what you know now, even if 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 the player was not a nice guy, mm -hmm. would you still want to to meet them? Me personally, yes, because then yes. I could get a picture with him and put it on social media and get a lot of likes. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. Is and then there, I would write I mean, a really long caption and I would like totally blow him up and be like, so and so is really mean. He was terrible. He wouldn't sign balls for children. That's what who, I would do. Who? Um, uh, well, we can't. We won't ask who was the worst because we won't put any guys on blast like that. No. But who was the best? We won't put any guys on blast, but I want to ask you, I don't know, maybe you can name drop here, but in that 2009 season, who made you wait the longest for an interview? Or maybe Jose anything. Reyes. Girl, I was about to say the same thing. Jose <laughs> Reyes made me wait so long. And Jose, if you're ever going to watch this, I want you to know I'm still waiting. <laughs> still Listen, waiting. Jose, Jose Reyes, la melaza. He is really fun, always had a great time, and always gave really good interviews because he was just so fun. But Jose will make you wait. Wait. And wait. And wait, sometimes till the following day because then it'll be like, oh, it's too late. I gotta, oh, I'll catch you tomorrow. <laughs> I'd be like, are you serious? Till one day, one day, when he was with Toronto, when he was with the Blue Jays, uh, Jose Bautista, this was during spring training. And Jose Bautista knew that, obviously, you know, when you go down to spring training, you're coming from New York, and it's a whole trip and everything. Yeah. So I'm down there, and I interview Jose Bautista, and then he's like, oh, he's like, you're waiting for, for Reyes? And I'm like, yeah, but he hasn't come. I'm just waiting. And he's like, so Jose Bautista was like, yo, these girls have come here all the way from New York. Get your butt over here and give the interview. I was like, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bad so flip all you Joey want, Bats. baby. Bad yes. flip all you want. You earned yes. it. You yes. Earned Joey it. Bats. Yes, Joey yes. Bats. Man, I miss Joey Bats in the bath. And that bath, one of the greatest bat flips of all time. But yes, he well, earned fine. that 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 um that bat flip. And La Melaza, I, I mean, he knows. He just used to make us wait. He was the <laughs> and it's worst. funny that we were on the same page with that one yes. because I was thinking it, and I'm like, I don't want to say it, but I'm wondering who it was, no, and I'm like, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll say it. he's him. not playing, and he's not playing right now. <laughs> but he knows I got nothing but love for him because I mean, of when course. he finally did give interviews, he was, and, and it's not that he wouldn't give yeah. interviews; it's just that he made you wait because yeah. sometimes. He made you wait. Yeah, I mean, unless you had a scheduled sit-down interview with him, it was kind of right. hard because he'd come out, he'd stretch, and then he'd go take BP, then he'd go catch grounders, and right. then he'd probably sometimes, then he'd go sign autographs for fans, and then made his way to long, <laughs> back to the dugout, and then give you the interview. But it was just always a long, <laughs> a long wait. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It oh, was, yeah. it was. So, guys, for our polls, so who's going to pick, uh, for, for the fans who are going to pick our names, let's say, uh, okay, Las Chicas, Jen and Julie from the blog, or La Vida with Jay and Jay. I think those are three pretty good options. Unless you have any other options, let us know. Pick a name for us, and hopefully by the next time that we're on with Julie, we'll have a name. <laughs> Because right now it's just Julie and Jen. <laughs> right now it's just Julie and Jen talking baseball. Yeah, talking, <laughs> yeah, and which, is, which is not bad, Julie and Jen wow. talking baseball. Julie and Jen, that's I'm it. on baseball. I mean, that's, now wait, that, that where, the name. where on the East Coast did you grow up, though? I grew up in Jersey. Uh, oh, in Jersey, okay. Yeah, Bergen County. And, but I like to say that I'm both Jersey and New York because my mom works in, in the city. She works in Washington Heights. So I was always at her office. I was always at her job, like growing up. I would spend a lot of my time there, a lot of my summers in, in the city. So mm -hmm. I'd like to say I'm from, I'm from both. I was able to experience both cultures because living in the suburbs is much different than living in Washington Heights. Yeah, absolutely. Very different. So I was, I'm very happy that I was exposed to that and not cultured in, in you know, very suburbia and uh, very white. Uh, town that I grew up in, I was very much exposed to culture and the urban culture and our people and our food and music. And that was something that was very big in our house. I don't know. How about yours? Is, is the culture was still a big thing, right? 
Definitely. And especially whenever we would go, you know, back east, um, after we had moved out to the West Coast, go back east and then we'd have any family gatherings. I mean, that's because my mom is one of eight. So I've got eight aunties and uncles and yes, on, that's yeah. on the Puerto Rican side. And so yeah. and they all have a bunch of kids. So like any yeah. kind of family gathering, it was it was always a party. And so that's when I felt the most immersed. But then uh -huh. kind of like how you were saying, growing up in the suburbs, it's definitely different than growing up in the city. And I was born in Queens in Belrose. Mm -hmm. And then we moved out to basically essentially Orange County, California, which is very, very, very suburban. And I would even have, you know, friends come over to the house and be like, is that, is that your housekeeper? And I'm like, that's my mom, you know, like that's, that's my well, mom. So that, yeah. So that's, yeah. So that's how outside of the culture they were there yeah. to think that is that, is that the house? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's yeah, but so that's, it's very, it is very different. I mean, they used to yeah. call me the Dominican white girl. And I grew up in May Maywood, New Jersey. Shout out to Maywood, New Jersey. And it was. I mean, I was one of a few Latinos that went in, in, in our middle school. High school was very different. It was very much diverse. Mm -hmm. But our, our town, yeah, our suburb, it's very different. So I'm very happy that I was exposed to, to the culture outside outside of that. Because yeah. to be able to, to experience the life, the music, the food, just the people, and grow up with all of those experiences, I'm sure has formed you into the woman that you are today as well. Absolutely. I mean, when I moved out to, to Orange County when I was a kid, you couldn't find Goya. There was no adobo seasoning. <laughs> you couldn't find it. They didn't have it. You had to go to, like, you had to seek out a, you know, a Mexican market and then hope that they had it because mm -hmm. they wouldn't even carry it. And there was one, and to this day, there's still only one Puerto Rican restaurant called Senor Ed's. In, or in the sort of town that I'm from in, in the area. And even then you still have to drive about a half an hour. One Puerto Rican restaurant. I didn't know any other Puerto Ricans in my town when I was oh growing up. That's so, so funny. You know, it's funny that you say that because even right now in Chicago, in Chicago, I mean, it, it has its pockets of diverse culture but downtown chicago is still very it's it's very much not sec it's very much segregated and mm -hmm. i mean me as a dominican you know we love our plantains you know we love our platano power <laughs> so when i go to the supermarket here i'm like where do i find plantains so i actually i dm'd pedro stroke and i was like yo I, do you find plantains in Chicago and he was started laughing. He's like, "Yes, you can. You just got to go to the to the towns." And then I so I went to Humboldt Park, and uh -huh. Humboldt Park is a large Puerto Rican community. Yo, I got plantains. I got yuca. <laughs> I, I got it all. I got it all. <laughs> so my fridge is stacked with some plantains. I got to make some some mango or like, do you do you eat mofongo? I do. I do. I eat everything. I eat everything <laughs> except for bacalao. Oh, I don't like bacalao either. I don't so like it, up, and it smells up the like whole it. house. It's fit, guys. It's it's basically codfish, codfish right? Codfish fritters. Yeah, and, yeah. Codfish fritters. I don't like it. I, yep, me neither. I, Whatever. My mom's like, my mom, you eat fish. I'm like, I don't like that. Oh my god, no! When my mom used to make it, I used to go up into my room, and mm -hmm. I used to put like towels underneath the door so the smell wouldn't permeate my room because it smelled so much. It was just like the worst, I don't know what about it, but anytime I smell it, I just, I can't. I can't, it's the only <laughs> thing I'm just like not down with <laughs> at all. Oh my goodness. So some other things that we're gonna be talking about, I mean, we've, we've got so many things to talk about. We're just giving you guys kind of a preview uh, of what it is that this hour is gonna be about. But another thing that obviously us as women love to talk about is other women in sports and other women in um in baseball and it's obviously it's so important because i think women are really making strides right when it comes to 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 baseball and and the jobs and the opportunities that that they're getting yeah definitely i mean there there i don't know about you but every time i open up my social media i have DMs, I have messages, I have messages on LinkedIn of women, girls asking, how did you get into sports? How did you get started? And 
it's it, now we're seeing so many more women, so many more Latina women out there in front of the camera doing their thing. And so that's why it was really important to me also to shine a light on these women who are doing it, performing at the top of their game and doing what they do and kind of interviewing them and talking to them how they got started. And that's why it's so important for us to tell our story so that yes. young women can hear and so that they can sort of get an idea of how to get started if that's the career path they want to follow. So, yeah, so I thought, you know, there's so many, God, there's so many women there. A couple of ones that I wanted to talk about was Alana Rizzo. She's a sideline reporter for the Dodgers. She's half Cuban, half Italian. She does her interviews um, in Spanish first and then in English if the player, She was the first you know, to do that and the only one yeah. to do that. When I saw Alana Rizzo um, mm -hmm. during a post-game interview, I don't remember who she was doing, but talking Spanish on MLB Network, I was like, oh my God, yeah. finally, somebody, they have somebody who can do it and then she's doing it. Yeah, I love Alana. Yeah. She's, to me, she's the best in the business. She's incredible. And a lot of those interviews were with Puig because she would, and yes, she was able yes, to, Puig, you know, yes. <laughs> right? And like, she was able to have like a great rapport with him. And, and it was just, it brought so much to the interviews. It was so wonderful. And she just seamlessly, you know, went back and forth between English and Spanish. Just beautiful to watch what she does. Um, and, and also, uh, Mary Sal Castro, who's the PA announcer for the New York Mets is the first time they had a, Latina woman as a PA announcer. And mm -hmm. a funny story about her that I think is so interesting. She went around into the clubhouse on her first day on the job and she went around to all the players and she said, how do you want your name pronounced? English players, Spanish players went around and said, how do you want your name pronounced? And to a lot of the Latin guys, they started smiling because they were like, oh, nobody's ever asked us that before. Nobody's really cared. Yeah. Nobody's really cared. Right. So the fact that she pronounces their names the way they wish them to be pronounced, I think is, is showing a lot of, a lot of honor right there. And, and there was also a story that on her first day on the job, there was a little girl, um, her first game rather, there was a little girl in the stands that had a sign that said, congrats, you're the first woman. Wow. Which is so amazing, shows. right? Like, I mean, they're, we're doing it, lady. We're doing it. We're changing. Yeah. <laughs> we're changing it. And um, then um, you've got Jessica Mendoza. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. Just breaking barriers, you know, breaking Amazing. that glass ceiling. Uh, on with. She, she was the first to to do Sunday night baseball and. Yep. She does an amazing job at it. And then the Mets also hire her to be in their front office. I mean you can't get even better than that than to have more women be seen as executives, you know, to be yeah. seen like they can make decisions in baseball in front office. It's not even just being in front of the camera anymore. We can, we do a lot and there are a few, but there needs to be more women yeah. in executive positions. Definitely. I would love to, I mean, I, I've actually never had the chance to interview her, but God, I would love to get her on the show because I remember yeah. when she first started, the backlash on yeah. social media because of a female voice. And, the, and it was just because people heard a female voice, they didn't even know her credits, they didn't even know her background, her resume, what she had accomplished for mm -hmm. her own career, which is uh, incredible in itself. I mean, she's, she's an Olympic medalist and, and you're condemning her because she's a female voice and all of a sudden all of the comments on social media were, what do you know about baseball? Why are you talking? Yeah, and like I just like any of the men who who talk baseball, not all many of them don't play baseball or have right. not played baseball, professional baseball at right. least. And so a lot of the criticism was, oh, she played softball. It's not the same. Right. But she's not watching softball. Like she's she has all of the ability and the experience to talk baseball because you right. just it, you don't need to have played baseball, professional baseball in order to know the game. Right. Of course. No, I, I mean, I, I'm so glad that ESPN stuck with her. I'm glad that they gave her a chance to grow. And I, I'm interested to know and interested to ask her just sort of how she overcame that, because that's a lot. And of course, you could say, oh, I don't read the comments. I don't read the comments. But, but everybody was critical of her. Everybody in the yeah. papers, the reviews, everybody was critical of her. And the fact that she goes on with such style and such grace, I've, I have seen her in the dugout a few times during um, some nationally televised games um, when I wasn't doing, 
you know, sideline, but I was there just to get a couple pieces. Um, and I, so I've seen her and she carries herself with such grace and does not let any of that get to her. At least that's how it seems from the outside. She and, was always really nice. She's yeah. always been really nice. And I, I've gotten to say hi to her a couple of times, especially when she started with MLB, with MLB and just being there and seeing her as a Latina to see another face. I was always like props, you yeah. know? Like it's just it's amazing to 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 see that doors are opening, but a lot more need to open. Yes, absolutely. We're not just pretty faces. I mean, we look good and we try to be cute, but it's not all about that, you know. It, yeah. it, there is there is more to the face. There is more, you know. There we've got some stuff up here, you know. We 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 can spit some knowledge. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope that more opportunities open up, especially, and, and I think they will, especially as we see, you know, the cultural shift in baseball, as we mm -hmm. see so many Latin players coming up and being called up to the majors. I think there is going to be that need. There is going to be that need. And, and I think Alana Rizzo is, is, you know, trailblazing by being able to do interviews in both English and Spanish. And, and I think, you know, at this point, when you're working for a team like the Padres, where it's almost 60-40, you know, 60-40 white to Latino, I think that they're going to come to a place where, I mean, you can only get so much when you have to go through the interpreter. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, like a, it's like a barrier, and it's tough to convey that emotion. It's tough to relay those questions and to, you know, really get that moment post-game that you want to capture with it's your It's funny. Interview. It's funny that you mentioned the the translator, though. I mean, Carlos Beltran was the one who made that happen. He was the one that really pushed for for the Latino players to have a translator because up until what a couple of years ago, what, two years ago maybe, yeah. players were translating for players. That was it was yeah. not even a thing. And then Carlos, right. I think, really advocated for that. And then the union and then MLB finally made that happen, which was a really it was a really good thing to to be seen. Right. Because sometimes yeah. you, you don't feel seen when those things happen because the Japanese, the Asian players always had a translator. Right. Always. Yeah. But the Latino players were like, hey, we're, we're here, too. We don't yeah. speak the language either. Absolutely. I mean, that happened in 2016. That's when the jurisdiction came out that, you know, across the board, every major league team had to have an interpreter. And it also took a lot of the pressure off of the other guys that spoke English and Spanish and were able to, you know, to interpret because then it would fall on them. So not only did they have a full time job as being a player, but they also had to do that work and they shouldn't have to do that work. Whereas when you have a Japanese player, he's usually the only guy on the team. So there <laughs> yes. they have, he's the only Japanese guy on the team. You, you get one, maybe two, but you get one. So like, yeah. you gotta have some, you know, you have to have that interpreter there. And so to see that, I know Carlos Villanueva in, on the Padres, he was very instrumental in that as well because it used to fall on him. And he mm -hmm. used to be the one who would have to, you know, interpret. And he was, I remember him telling me he was so happy that he didn't have to do that anymore. I mean, he was happy to do it for the guys, but he was like, but oh man. I don't have yeah. to worry about being in the clubhouse at the same time as that guy, position player, when I'm in the bullpen and I got to be doing my, you know, stuff, but I got to be here for him because he's got to answer questions. So, and then things get lost in translation as well because they're not the professional interpreters. So right. things can get lost in translation. And when those things happen, then, well, whose fault is it for miscommunicating? You know, you don't want that. You don't want that on, on a player. It, it, it's and I'm so happy that 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 was passed and yeah. just you know, MLB is doing little by little, making strides in the right direction when it comes to inclusivity and diversity mm -hmm. and all the things that are important. Yeah, definitely. Now, I, before we go, we've got like five minutes left. I want to remind our fans and people who are watching at home that they need to follow us on social media. They need to go to at La Vida Baseball, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. You can find all of our great content right there at La Vida Baseball on all social media platforms. And at the same time, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And sometimes, you know, if you're a certain number of follower, you could win Lovey the Baseball swag. Just just as a reminder, are you, are you going to go subscribe? Yeah, I, I'm doing it right now. 
Yeah. I'm doing it right now. That's exactly Spreading. what you need to Watch do. Watch me. If exactly do what Julie does and subscribe to our Lovey the Baseball channel, subscribe to our YouTube, subscribe to our Facebook, everything. And we are everywhere. You cannot miss us. Make sure to follow. <laughs> and that you guys can find Julie on on Instagram as well, right? To add Julie Alexandria. Is that is that it? Yeah, Julie Alexandria zero zero. Because Julie. apparently there's somebody else named Julie Alexandria. <laughs> I was a late adopter to Instagram. I was a very late adopter, which I regret because I could have been an influencer and been paid to post, but I'm not. So you can. Um, we'll get you there. We'll get you there. Get me there, girl. Give me those likes. Give me those likes. We'll get you. Um, yeah, we'll get you there. But you also do. I mean, you're a mom. You know? So, I know. So, how, how has it been? How is mommyhood? It's a lot, girl. It's a lot. And they don't even tell you. It's a trip. It, imagine what do you wish you had known before? Oh. I mean, obviously everything is a blessing, but what, what was like yeah. one thing that you're like, gosh, I wish you would have just told me so I would have known. <laughs> I, I guess I just wish I would have known that it is literally a 24-7 job and that every moment you have to be on. Like, imagine a broadcast that never ends. <laughs> like you ever see those like HSN women, those videos where like they've been yeah, on camera for going. 17 hours and they're going like they're like short circuiting because they're like, I can't even, I can't even talk anymore. <laughs> That's literally what thing is like. And like it's my, my grandmother used to say, and mind you, she had eight kids, right? She used to say that um, having children is like uh, what, having milk on the stove, right? If you turn away oh, from milk on the stove. It, they do stuff like you turn away and they fall or they turn away and they put something in their mouth and you're like, uh-uh, don't, mm, don't put that in your mouth. So like it's, it is, I guess I wish I would have known that it's literally every minute of every day of every hour. And I'm saying that because he's only eight months old. So he's a little baby. I'm sure it gets easier as they get older. I, I think it doesn't because then they start walking. <laughs> And crawling, and then they start putting fingers in sockets and, oh and my pennies God. down their mouth. <laughs> Bro, look at this. You see this? This is on every <laughs> socket yep, in yep, the house. That, that's a mom's best friend because yep. that's what kids do. They put their fingers in their put their fingers in their nose and then put it in the sockets. <laughs> the hole, they'll put their finger in it. And then everything that's... goes to the mouth too. So my, my, my brother just, um, has a nine month old and yeah, and we're just constantly, you just have to be just eyes because they're yeah. quick, they move like this, just like you said, it is like having milk on the stove. It is, yeah. you turn your, back for one second and then yeah. all of a sudden it's like oh, what are you doing <laughs> literally but babies are amazing yeah. enjoy oh, it awesome. while while and enjoy him while he's still Thank kingston you. right kingston yeah yeah that's his name where'd the name come yeah. from so it was so i wanted something with a new york connotation i was thinking hudson lennox um Brooklyn, like different names of New York areas, um, mm -hmm. Rivington, you know, different stuff like that. And then my husband actually came up with Kingston and I thought, well, Kingston is a place in New York state. It was actually the capital of New York before the British burned it down in the 1700s. Um, and then it became uh, Albany. But um, Kingston, New York is a beautiful place in the Hudson Valley. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, you know, it was the only one we could agree on. So I was like, well, it fulfills the New York need mm -hmm. um, because New York is a very special place to me. And just, you know, I, I miss it every day. And well, that's another show. We'll that's talk another about show. That. That's yeah. Another show. But yeah, I, I do miss New York all the time. So so I wanted something with the New York connotation. And, and so Kingston, it, it is. Awesome. Well, Julie, yeah. our hour is up. We oh. are done. Um, for today, thank you so much for being on with us. Let me remind all, right. all of you at home, you can watch us again on YouTube, Facebook, but you can watch us on the next one. Next Wednesday, we'll be here in the last hour of Love You The Baseball Live. Make sure to catch us. Julie's calling in every Wednesday, all the way from sunny California. We're here in foggy Chicago, <laughs> but it's all good. Um, hugs, kisses for you. Thank you so much, and I'm looking forward Here's to the up. next one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.